Hello, Ilana. Okay, well, I think we will get going. Um, we will, um, I'm sure, have people continuing to log in as we get going. Um, but I, I, in honor of everybody's time, I'd like to, to be punctual here. Uh, my name is Tom Fleischner, and I, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you all um, to this wonderful event, um, Story and the Ecological Imagination. Uh, I'm, I'm welcoming you wearing two different hats. Um, uh, as, the, uh, as the chair of the Natural History Section of the Ecological Society of America, um, who is one sponsor of the, of the event, and also as the executive director of the Natural History Institute, a nonprofit organization based here in Prescott, Arizona, which is the other, um, is a co-sponsored co event, and also um, want to uh, give a big shout out to our co-sponsor, the King's English Bookstore in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I wanted to, to tell you just very quickly, uh, sort of the story of this uh, event on story. Um, so uh, initially, uh, the, this, is, is it, this event is offered in conjunction with the annual conference of the Ecological Society of, Mer of America, or ESA, which is the, the largest group of professional ecologists in the world. Um, and uh, it was a originally designed uh, as a way, to, it was going to be at the King's English Bookstore, a wonderful independent bookstore in Salt Lake, and as a way of sort of uh, getting integration between the local community in Salt Lake City and the ESA conferees. Uh, it was actually the brainchild of Nalini Ned Carney, who you'll, who you'll see here in a moment. Um, and uh, so we had it set up as an in-person uh, event, of course, and we all know why we're not all sitting in Salt Lake City right now. Uh, the, the bright side of that is that the, um, uh, the doing it in this way online has, has allowed us to have a, a much um, uh, uh, larger, have more people involved and to have uh, a greater geography represented both in terms of actually the presenters as well as the audience. And we, tr we have people um, engaged here uh, from many different countries uh, and so on. So we're really delighted to have, have you all with us. Um, I wanted to, um, to share with you uh, part of way back in the, 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 uh, the late Holocene or so, uh, we, we had to put in a proposal for this to, to the Ecological Society. And part of what, what we said in that proposal was one of the most fundamental human commonalities is a need for and response to story. Stories connect us to one another and to place. They provoke feelings in us and prompt us to action. As the foundation of ecology, natural history, Historia naturalis, literally the story of nature, is rich with stories that can captivate a wide variety of audiences with ecological themes. So that was uh, a big part of the, the sort of rationale for this. And uh, I might add um, uh, something some of you may be familiar with, Barry Lopez's wonderful fable, Crow and Weasel, and one of the characters in that book, Badger Woman says something I've always remembered. It's sometimes a person needs a story more than food to stay alive. So this is an evening for stories, and we have uh, some wonderful storytellers with us. Um, so I want to just tell you how this is going to work. Uh, we were worried uh, about a potential meltdown um, of uh, uh, sort of electronic internet connections with so many different people involved. Uh, and especially because some of us live in, in high thunderstorm risk uh, areas and actually there's a hurricane coming up the, the East Coast right now. So um, we decided uh, what we did is we invited each of the authors to pre-record uh, their reading, it, each of which is in the five to six minute range. And we will, uh, we're going to show you the first four of those and then I'll come back on and then briefly um, uh, and I'll introduce those four readers and then uh, do the same for the second four. And then after that, there is, uh, we'll be opening it up for question and answer. And um, just wanted to tell you how that is gonna work. Um, for those of you, uh, I know many of you are more familiar with Zoom than you ever dreamed of, but for those who aren't at the bottom 
on the bottom panel on the right side, there's a, a, a little icon for Q&A. And at any time throughout the, the, the program, you can type a question in there uh, and it can be directed uh, towards a specific uh, author or it can be just uh, to the whole group. And then when we get to that stage, I will do my best to manage those questions and, 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 um, uh, and kind of deal with as many of them as possible. And because of that, um, uh, because there, there may be a great many, because we have a big, a big crowd here today, um, the, uh, we would also encourage people, there's a, there's a little uh, mechanism in that Q&A function where you can do a thumbs up. And so if there's a question that somebody else has put down that you, it says, yeah, that's what I want to hear, go ahead and do that. And that'll help us prioritize things. Um, I also um, uh, want to give a shout out to uh, our intern at the Institute, Zora Elungo reed who is the sort of brains behind the operation. She's uh, really done a lot of the, of the heavy lifting behind the scenes. So thank you to Zora. And um, finally, to say that um, uh, this will be, so everybody knows this will be, this whole session will be archived on the Natural History Institute's uh, YouTube channel. So we encourage you to check out a lot of good stuff on there as well as this. And so if you want somebody else to see it or whatnot, that's where it will be. Um, and so I'm going to uh, introduce the first four readers, and then we're going to um, bring the, the, uh, the reading, the first four readings online. And um, I'm just going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to give be very brief in the introductions that I give, but every one of the, the people reading here today is, is a fascinating, wonderful person with great work uh, available. So I really encourage you to check them all out online and, else, and elsewhere. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first four readers. Um, first will be Nalini Nadkarni. Uh, Nalini, as I mentioned, was actually the, the this was her brainchild. Uh, Nalini is, among many other things, a professor of biology at the University of Utah. Uh, second will be Richard Neville. Uh, Richard is the deputy director of the Earth Systems Program at Stanford University. Uh, next will be Julia Corbett. Uh, Julia is um, a professor in the Department of Communication and, or Departments of Communication and Environmental Humanities at the University of Utah. And then fourth will be uh, Drew Lanham. Uh, Drew is uh, alumni distinguished professor of wildlife ecology at Clemson University. Uh, so those will be our first four. And I, and I might mention, um, unfortunately, Drew had a conflict develop, so he is not gonna be able to be with us in the question and answer part of this, but I'll mention that the Natural History Institute is doing a special program with Drew in a couple of weeks. Uh, so if you, uh, you want to see Drew, uh, that's on August 20th. Um, so, okay. So thank you so much. And we'll turn it over to uh, let Zora get us on screen here. And I will get myself off. A Tapestry of Browns and Greens. This is a chapter in a book edited by Allison Deming and Lorette Savoy, published in 2011 by Milkweed Press. It starts with a little poem by Rabindranath Tagore. The tapestry of life's story is woven with the threads of life's ties, ever joining and breaking. My father was a Hindu who emigrated from India for his doctorate in pharmacology. My mother, who studied Romance languages, was raised in Brooklyn, New York, as an Orthodox Jew by parents who had fled the pogroms of Russia. My parents met in graduate school, married, and moved to suburban Maryland. I was the third of five children, the darkest of the bunch, the most Indian in face and body. My parents made our home a little India. They gave us all Indian names, even our cats and dogs. We had no dining room table, but ate Indian food with our fingers, sitting cross-legged on the floor. We slept on mattresses on the floor, just as my father did as a child in his village. Our two religions lived side by side, just as my sisters and I slept comfortably together on floor-level mattresses. But outsiders saw only our differences. My parents actually couldn't marry legally in Washington, D.C. because the miscegenation laws considered my dark-skinned father a Negro. They had to take a bus to New York to be wed. Growing up, I learned that nature both needed protection and provided protection. Although my father was stern, he had a benevolent attitude toward nature. 
I remember the care he showed when we transplanted saplings. I wonder if he saw himself in those displaced trees, a fellow migrant. I learned also that nature protected me. Tree climbing was a near daily pleasure for me. Treetops were refuges from the world of homework and chores, fighting with siblings and strict parental directives. Those strong limbs held me up for as long as I wished. In my imagination, those treetop roosts became in turn a place to sequester Anne Frank, a refuge for wounded soldiers and a rescue vessel, vessel in case of drastic emergency flooding. It was my ark, a place that protected me and those I cared for. In college, I discovered the world of forest ecology. I enjoyed the challenge of untangling the endless puzzles that I encountered in nature. In graduate school, I became inspired to study the forest canopy, known then as the last biotic frontier. In the more than 30 years that followed, my students and I have learned that plants that live their lives high above the forest floor are critical threads in the complex tapestry of rainforests. Throughout my academic career, I was also drawn to engage with people outside of academia who have knowledge and values that seem equally valued to those inside it, but who are often excluded from it. For example, formal religion is a powerful force in our society, but one with a low profile in academia. I thought that documenting how people of different faiths describe trees in their own holy scriptures and in their own places of worship might inspire them to be better stewards of forests. Drawing from the Bible, the Talmud, and the Quran, I developed a sermon about trees and spirituality that I've delivered in 40 churches, synagogues, and temples. No matter what the faith, I never had arguments about creationism versus evolution. Rather, congregants listened attentively, participated in discussions after the sermon, suggested hymns that I had overlooked, and passed me on to other churches. I've also engaged people who are the most distant from nature, the over 2 million adults in our country who are incarcerated. In 2003, I worked with inmates at a state pr prison near my campus in a moss growing project designed to help relieve pressure of collecting mosses from the wild for the horticulture trade. We gave each inmate a notebook and pencil to write observations. They quickly learned to identify common moss species. And the corrections center staff were astonished at the energy, the interest, and the patience of these inmates. That led to my launching an in-prison lecture series for inmates and prison staff by my fellow faculty members. Since then, providing conservation projects and science lectures has spread to many prisons across the country. And I think these experiences reinforced the concept that all voices, all approaches, and all types of people can contribute to keeping the great tapestry of nature intact. There have been times in my life when I've encountered dark colors, when I've misplaced my sense of self, when I've nearly disappeared in a place of no light. Perhaps this was because I have endlessly needed to show myself and others that a small brown woman is as worthy of opportunities as a large white person. Mindful breathing locates us when we are lost or frightened. And although trees do not have lungs or gills as animals do, plants breathe all day and all night. Thus, every leaf becomes a connector amongst living things. And in those dark times, I could look out at a maple tree in my backyard and be reminded that I am connected to other living things. What has fueled this journey, which has taken me from the ivory towers of academia to the watchtowers of prison yards. I think it's the strong colors of my parents' two cultures that mixed but did not merge. They coexisted, retaining their own purity. This allowed me to see multiplicity in everything around me, the subtle differences between species niches and forest canopies, the multiple values that trees provide humans, and the many valid ways that people come to understand nature and the world. I see nature as a precious and multicolored tapestry, which has made me mindful about protecting its intricate patterns from raveling, fading, vanishing. Hi, I'm Richard Neville. I'm here in my backyard in San Jose, California, and I'm excited to be with you to share an excerpt from a book that I'm writing with my dear friend, poet Stephen Nightingale. 
Our book is a conversation of poems and essays about the natural history of the Sierra Nevada that's inspired by a range crossing backpacking trip that we took with our families in 2017. I'll be reading an excerpt from my essay on the Sierra Nevada mountain yellow-legged frog, which is a species that's endemic to the range. But before I begin, I would like to thank the Natural History Institute, the Natural History section of the Ecological Society of America, and the King's English Bookstore in Salt Lake City, Utah for co-sponsoring this event and for inviting me to participate. Thank you. The Sierra Nevada high country is a land for gathering water, where bowls of hollowed stone hold lakes the color of sky. The lakes open to the enfolding and infinitely varied movement of clouds, and on clear nights, to the lonely turning of the stars. Silver threads of streams slip from lakes' moraine edges. Water pours between stones, tumbles, falls, funnels to plunges, whirls into pools, scatters in ripples. Water rings, swirls, gulps, glumps, hums, hushes, all at once. The water sings. The water is singing now. At the edge of a Sierra stream, wind brushes the sedged meadow along its bank. Pine branches whisper among themselves, hiding small flocks of chickadees seat seating their tiny bell notes. Cloud shadows in the distance darken the bare mountain slopes. A smooth stone sits in the shallows of a stream nearby, warms itself in the afternoon sun. At the stone's submerged edge rests a frog, as small as a baby's hand, as still as a Buddha. The frog appears to be smiling. The frog may be in fact smiling. The frog may be in fact a Buddha. Had you not looked carefully, you might have mistaken this diminutive amphibious bodhisattva for a stone. Water is refuge. Water is home. Study the form of this smiling frog. Her long hind legs fold beneath her, tapering to fans of slender toes draped over a twig. Delicate knobs texture her speckled back. Smooth, turmeric-hued skin rounds the beatific bowl of her belly. Her eyes peek just above the water. Their iris is glittered with flecks of green, gold, and black. Sneak closely enough, and you might notice a faint scent redolent of garlic. She is the mountain yellow-legged frog, a frog of two species found in the high, clear streams and lakes speckling the range of light. Rana Sierra dwells in the Sierra north of Mather Pass and the Monarch Divide, whereas her sister species, the longer-legged Rana mucosa, inhabits the range to the south and a few pocket-sized refuges in California's transverse ranges. A century ago, wanderers of the High Sierra encountered mountain yellow-legged frogs in such plenitude that a certain care and gentleness was required to avoid stepping on them. Even then, the frogs, once the Sierra's most abundant vertebrate, demanded a kind of benevolent attention. By the hundreds, the frogs gathered among the high lakes and streams, spending summer days basking in the sun, swimming in sunlit shallows, embracing in the mud, devouring banquets of caddisfly and mayfly larvae, all while they remained watchful for garter snakes slithering through the meadow grass. Now meeting frogs above 10,000 feet in elevation, dwelling with such apparent equanimity, raises certain existential questions. For how can this frog who lives a slight life so inextricably bound to liquid water, survived the Sierra's long and frigid winters. Consider a lake fringing patch of marsh, where in summertime, you might come upon a placid Sierra mountain yellow-legged frog relaxing in the afternoon sun, or gliding just below the surface of the lake beyond. Consider though that by January, a thick quilt of snow will lay upon the frozen lake and the open country about it. Trudge the lake's snowy perimeter, cross its ice-bound length, and you will catch neither sight nor sign of a single Sierra Nevada mountain yellow-legged frog. Yet they are present, hidden in the water beneath the lake's frozen surface, or perhaps tucked in cracks, or among stones and slow-moving streams, sheathed by glazes of translucent ice. The frogs wait in a torpor, 
biding their time for long months in aqueous darkness. Each day glows behind a pale scrim of ice. Each night falls as black and as cold as space. First year tadpoles drift in dreams, scarcely moving but from the insistent, rhythmic fluttering of their gills. They might overwinter two, maybe three more years before metamorphosing into full-grown adults. Come spring, though, the lakes and streams thaw. Frogs rejoin the land, bound across crusts of snow in search of lakes nearby, seeking their turquoise openings and companions who might gather with them there. Thank you. Hello, my name is Julia Corbett, and I'm going to be reading from the prologue called Culture and Everyday Nature from my book, Out of the Woods. People have been falling off cliffs, getting stuck in trees, and walking into traffic. It isn't the zombie apocalypse, but a monster catching game that people play on their cell phones. Pokemon Go is a phone-based version of the old Nintendo Pokemon that uses your phone's GPS to overlay pocket monsters onto real world places. As you move around, different digital monsters appear on your phone against a cartoon rendering of where you actually are. A news columnist proclaimed that this augmented reality game was helping people get outside, which positively affected physical and mental health. The summer the game was released, I watched my nephew play it. He got excited when his phone told him a Pokemon was near and emitted a satisfied yes when he caught one. The game was captivating, but there wasn't any imagination involved. You simply waited for creatures to appear. We were in Grand Teton National Park and his eyes were stuck on the phone screen. What's most curious to me is how this app depicts nature. You go outside not to enjoy what's out there, but for wild creatures uh, to materialize on your phone and they live only in places with cell coverage. You capture the creatures in tiny red balls who are then tamed by Pokemon trainers. Nature is merely the backdrop for technology to augment as a stylized cartoon. Pokemon Go is one of innumerable ways that culture colors our perceptions of what and where nature is. Ways that are often peculiar and largely unquestioned. Through words, pictures, and social cues, culture imprints our beliefs about nature from a very young age. Some animals are good, chimpanzees and butterflies, but just as many are bad, snakes, pigeons, and spiders. We know exactly what culturally acceptable greenery should go around the house. We know what dryer product will make the laundry smell as if it were dried outdoors. And if you ask most children, culture has already taught them all these things. The backdrop of culture hangs throughout our lives and affects how we think about and experience nature. Thus, it affects how we practice our everyday existence on this planet. The dictionary, a true product of human culture, defines nature as the natural world that exists without or beyond humans. So, huh, humans and all our stuff are not nature. We breathe the same air as those chimpanzees, drink the same water as butterflies, eat the plants from the land, and use elements from the earth to make absolutely all of our stuff, but somehow we are different and apart from nature. What a cultural setup. We're not on the same team, though we share the same planet. That setup includes where we think nature exists. And here I schlep my share of cultural baggage. I live during the academic year in Salt Lake City, the center of a bulging urban area that stretches north and south between two mountain ranges and supports over a million people. Though I love all the activity this city offers, I have always felt that I must escape to the nearby Wasatch Mountains to be in real nature. Herein lies my challenge. Though I know that humans are part of nature, I discount the nature where I live. Is it possible to draw back the cultural curtain and see the Oz that orchestrates my view? And can I somehow learn to consider the urban and wilder nature as differently peopled versions of the same matter? Okay, I'll skip to the end of the prologue. So the focus of the book is everyday nature. Um, we don't see nature as it is. We see nature as we are. It's why we believe that there isn't a way to which we send our garbage and why a yard shorn green grass expresses civic duty. The crescendo of city noise comes with a cultural belief that somehow we get used to it, even when it's collectively making us sick. 
People use the phrase out of the woods as though woods are dangerous, even though many believe this is where real nature lies. Some malls and restaurants are wrapped in culture, complete with nature features designed to make us feel good and buy more, well, nature. Everyday nature is where I engage the non-human most personally and continuously, the elements of which are individual, indivisible from nature's wilder cousin. It is impossible to separate the breath I just took from the air that jets and bees fly through, from the air traveling inside the tree in my backyard or in the mountain trees beyond. There is great value, indeed urgency, in knowing and understanding living vibrant nature and how it does what it does to produce both a towering spruce and a foam. And the best place to start truly knowing that nature is right out the front door. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Drew Lanham and I would like to share a reading uh, with you. Um, it's called Regenesis and the Wild God. Wildness is the God I worship. The sins to answer for are intrusion and extinction. Evolution is the miraculous creation story. Primordial ooze came to be named Adam. Lucy of the old of I gorge blossomed to Eve. She was not a spare rib of him, but of her own womb conceived. On the seventh day, billions of years from the first, God still cannot take a break. The rock she slung out with a bang from the dark to rest third from the modest star we call Earth throbs and pulses under a cloud of human combusted funk. There have been many floods and several arcs. The raven that never came back didn't return because it didn't want to get et like the witless dove with that olive branch. It was too smart and too black to fall for the drunken old sailor's trick. My grandmother sang that it wouldn't be water but fire next time, and that was the promise the mad god made. Turns out that he might have been half right, wondering how all those dinosaurs fit into that tiny ark. The next one coming is already here, rising around our ankles now, but was glacial ice just a little while back. The earth is on a slow burn, trying to drown itself back to cool. Mountains rose and are yet falling, ground down grain by grain, from granite to pebbles to sand to silt. We are all the alluvium sliding back to sea, ashes to the Atlantic, dust into the wind, ground like grain under pumice. Cain slays Abel daily by chokehold and gerrymander. Polar bears are the one white thing suffering injustice these days. Turns out that God liked it best when it was all connected in a single congealed pangeic mass, easier to walk from pole to pole without getting one's feet wet in a single great sea. If extinction is forever, why are we still here? If restoration ecology means making things like they were, when do I get my sanity back? Conservation demands a church, I think. No, I'm not speaking of any high steeple, stained glass temple, wall, place to worship some deity we can neither see nor feel, that is cast in the likeness of a Eurocentric oppressor, but rather some unified knowing that what we to have communion over is the work we do and then in the like-minded gathering to imbue some hope that what we enact to save will make tomorrow somehow better than today. Given the current state of environmental affairs and convergent plagues, I think that conservation demands this with hellish fires burning the world up from the ice caps down, another flood drowning those polar bears and little asthmatic black girls in the lower ninth ward in the same hot breath. 
and brimstone falling in the form of policies torn apart as viruses leap from wild beasts to human beasts, and we in the meantime kill one another with random acts of violence, it seems time to regather the congregation of wildlings for some sort of meditative dawn chorus singing that clarifies the fog in which we are all wandering. There must be some coming together in concerted worship of all the us concerned with being here in some semblance of peace with other beings. Our scripture will adhere to the sound science, rigorous investigation and data objectively gathered, chapter and verse, the what's, the how's, the when's, the where, occasionally the whys. We'll pass it by our peers for choir review, but then beyond the tomes we shelve, we must mission out the words in heart-rending ways. Marvin Gaye will sing The Ecology, and it will be timeless and good. We will all sing Mercy, Mercy Me. The humpback whales will sing in chorus, and the thrushes will help us all say, Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Nalini, Richard, Julia, and Drew. Um, stories are indeed healing. Um, so I'm just going to jump in here. Again, this is Tom Fleischner from the Natural History Institute and the Natural History section of, of ESA. Um, just uh, knowing that some people have joined us since, the, since I, we started to reiterate a couple of things. One is that uh, we will be having, we're gonna uh, be introducing the, the second four readers here momentarily, but we will, um, uh, after that, we'll have a question and answer session. And you can, at any time now, you can start to put questions you have for, for the whole panel or of readers or for any individual author using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen on your Zoom um, uh, screen. And I also wanted to, to reiterate that, that our partner and friends at the King's English Bookstore in Salt Lake City have, have uh, to encourage you to, to consider uh, supporting the authors and the King's English Bookstore uh, on their website, kingsenglish.com. They have, uh, under the events section, they have a, a special uh, feature with some of the books from the people reading here tonight. And we'll put that whole uh, link up at the end as well. So um, we will, uh, it's now my pleasure to, to introduce uh, the second uh, uh, batch of readers. So next we'll be hearing from Sailita Guy. Uh, Sailita is a bat biologist and science communications expert and also a research associate at the University of Toronto. Uh, following Sailita will be Susan M. Gaines, who is a founding director of the Fiction Meets Science program at the University of Bremen in Germany, and so she's joining us from the middle of the night. Uh, after Susan will be myself, uh, so I won't say much more about that. Again, I'm, I'm Tom Fleischner, I'm with the Natural History Institute. And, and uh, last but far from least, Steve Trimble, uh, who's an independent author and photographer of numerous books and who teaches uh, uh, writing in the undergraduate honors college and also the graduate environmental humanities programs at the University of Utah. Hello, and thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Dr. Sailita Guy, and I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my upcoming children's book, Adventures of Your Friendly Neighborhood Ecologist. And while the text and title aren't exactly finalized yet, this book is set to be published fall 2021 with Anik Press. So chapter eight, bird watching bias. What happens when citizen science doesn't tell us the whole story? The next time you're outside, listen closely. Do you hear anything singing from the trees or the rooftops? Chances are you've seen birds in your city before, but have you ever wondered how many species there are in your neighborhood? Or how the species on your block might be different from birds elsewhere in the city? Many urban ecologists want to understand where we find different species of wildlife. 
But sampling entire cities is often not possible, so scientists have to choose which areas they collect their data in. And as you've already learned, sometimes they get community help sampling these locations as well. Many citizen science projects get help collecting data from people all over the world. Take eBird, for example. Anyone can create a free online count and record where and when they see different species of birds. Scientists can then use this data to answer questions that require large amounts of information, like which species are in cities. But some scientists like Deja Perkins are worried that this data may not tell us the whole story. Because eBird volunteers get to choose where and when they collect data, Deja is concerned that not all areas are being sampled equally, especially in cities. So Deja is set on figuring out if eBird data is actually giving us an accurate picture of urban bird diversity. What happens when people don't want scientists in their neighborhoods? What are you doing here? Deja Perkins looked up from her clipboard. A woman she'd smiled at a few moments earlier now stood directly in front of her, and her expression wasn't very friendly. I'm a scientist, Deja said, explaining that she had come here to observe the birds in the neighborhood. The woman looked skeptical, so Deja pulled the flyer off her clipboard and handed it to her. This is part of a much larger project, Deja continued. We've got everyday people helping us survey birds across Durham, Raleigh, and Chapel Hill. Perhaps you'd be interested in helping us collect data. The woman aggressively handed the flyer back. I need you to leave, she said roughly. Deja was flustered. Usually once she explained her work to folks, they were excited and encouraging. This woman was the opposite. Pardon, Deja said. I need you to leave, the woman repeated. You're making me uncomfortable. Deja nodded. Uh, of course, I'll just sample somewhere else. Deja sped walked away. The whole interaction had put her on edge. She decided she would find a location to sample, perhaps somewhere more public. Not too far from the original spot, Deja found a small pond with a walking trail around it. Perfect. It was quiet and overcast. And after the unsettling interaction she just had, Deja wished there were more people around. Getting ready to begin her sampling, Deja look, took a 360 degree photo of the site and pulled out her clipboard again. As she scanned the area, Deja caught sight of a small black bird flying from bush to bush in the distance. Excited, she grabbed her binoculars hoping to identify it, but what she saw instead made her heart sink. I don't believe this, Deja said under her breath. Just past the bush was the same woman who had asked Deja to leave, but she now had a very large dog. Maybe she's just out walking her dog, Deja thought. It, it must be a coincidence. But deep down, Deja knew it wasn't. She was shook. She thought about canceling her data collection altogether, but she was in a public space. She had the right to be there. So for the next 10 minutes, Deja recorded every bird she saw and heard, determined to not let the woman intimidate her. Before Deja knew it, she had forgotten all about the woman watching her. Instead, she was filled with a sense of joy that bird watching always gave her. The woman with the dog did not budge for the entire sampling period. When she had collected her data, Deja quickly packed everything up and made her way to the car. As she pulled away from the curb, Deja felt a sense of relief. Although she was unnerved, she was glad that she'd stood her ground. At least I saw my first green heron today, Deja thought happily, as the sun finally peeked through the clap. And there you have it. That's a short excerpt from my upcoming children's book, Adventures of Your Friendly Neighborhood Urban Ecologist, set to be published with Annick Press in fall of 2021. And I don't think I can accurately describe how excited I am to get this book into the hands of children. It teaches kids all about the science of urban ecology through the stories and work of eight urban ecologists from across North America. This book has everything from birds to bees and microplastics to trees, and it's got a set of challenges that are meant to get kids outside and exploring their neighborhoods and urban bird biodiversity uh, with their friends and family. And so uh, I'm hoping that there's something in here for all city nature enthusiasts, young and old. 
You're about to hear from Gabriel, uh, the 23-year-old protagonist of Accidentals. And in this scene, uh, he's bird watching in a patch of virgin marsh on his family's land in Uruguay, where he discovers two of the novel's other main protagonists. The reed bed was just the entree to a marsh that was more varied and three-dimensional, more magical and unfathomable than any marsh I'd ever known. It was hard to spot the birds among the reeds, but some hundred yards in, I came upon a small open glade that was so crowded with ducks and strange wading birds, I felt as if I'd stepped into a natural history museum diorama. A golden brown bittern standing in the flooded grass, staring up at the heavens, as if waiting for a meteor to land in a ball of fire on the point of its bill. A chicken-like bird with the most intense purple blue plumage I'd ever seen, walking like Jesus across the surface of a water lily-covered pond. Two huge pink wading birds feeding in the shallows, stirring the water with bills like large wooden spoons. A pair of little reddish-brown ducks floating in the water near the opposite shore. Mirasol grande, espátula rosada, boijona azul, pato fiero. They paid me no heed, and I stayed there watching and drawing the scene for as long as I could bear the mosquitoes. When I was a kid, I kept a life list of birds I'd seen for the first time, placing little check marks next to their names at the back of my Peterson guide. By high school, the only new additions were accidentals, migrating birds who'd gotten lost or inexplicable strays who'd wandered away from their normal ranges. If I still kept that list, I could have added more than 20 life birds in the just three days. I was following one of them through the reeds, or rather, trying to get a look at one I had yet to identify when I got lost. I had noticed one lonely, insistent voice in the marsh's evening symphony, a low, hollow-sounding trill like a bassoon running down a scale and sliding off the end, and then I caught a brief glimpse of a fist-sized bird running across the mud. I assumed it was some sort of rail, but it disappeared before I got a good look, and then it led me snaking through the reeds with its calls until I lost both the route I'd marked and my sense of direction. When I finally found my way out, I was on Caruso's property, and the flooded rice fields were aglow with the first colors of the setting sun. I climbed an embankment, trying to get my bearings, and was surprised to spot some familiar characters among the ibis feeding in the fields below. Black neck stilt, American golden plover, lesser yellow legs, and in the next paddy over, standing like a lone heron between two tired-looking palm trees, a single representative of Homo sapiens. Young adult female, slight build, thin arms, knobby knees, black hair pulled into a thick, thick ponytail. She had a canvas bag and a bunch of strange contraptions hanging around her neck. What was she doing out there? She set something into the bag and started making her way toward the levee on the other side of the field, where I noticed there was a car parked. Even wading through the mud with all that awkward equipment, she moved with such an arresting mix of competence and sensuality that I wanted to stand there watching her all day. I forced myself to lower the binoculars. This was, after all, a woman I was looking at, not some exotic species of heron. I leapt across the irrigation ditch and proceeded down the levee to the next field. A heron would have been following my every move, watching me through one eye as I neared, preparing its escape. But the woman approached the car and started disentangling herself from her equipment, seemingly oblivious to my presence. I was still trying to decide how to announce myself without startling her, when a dead old ra rose from the grass, screaming, and she finally looked my way. Hola, I cried, waving and trying to appear unthreatening, though I felt ridiculous with the hysterical dead old threatening to dive bomb me. We introduced ourselves politely. Gabriel Haynes, Alejandro Silva, Encantada, Encantado, pleased to meet you, and I thought how absurd it seemed out there in the middle of the empty countryside, and yet it was truer to form than I'd ever imagined such a greeting could be, as I was quite literally encantado, enchanted, under a spell, the sensation so real, so visceral, it was hard to dismiss, for all that I really wasn't superstitious. She stepped back and looked at my binoculars and my muddy rubber boots, and I looked at her bare legs and equally muddy boots, and gestured at the canvas bag she was cradling and the pile of equipment she deposited on the ground next to the car. What are you doing? we asked as our gazes met, speaking simultaneously, and then waiting simultaneously for each other to reply. She tossed back her head and chortled with obvious delight, then fished a small jar out of the bag and held it up. I'm collecting samples, she said. Of? Mud and water. 
She opened the ice chest in the back of the car and deposited the jar inside. A potent brew of microbes, she added theatrically, with earth-shaking earth consequences for the future of rice farming. She was a microbiologist from the university, she told me, and Caruso had given her permission to do a study on his land. And you, she asked? You don't sound Uruguayan. I'm from California. My mother is Uruguayan and she just moved back. You moved here from California? No, no, my mother did, Lidiana Quiroga. I'm just here for the summer between jobs. This isn't exactly Uruguay's most popular beach report, resort, she said, swatting at a mosquito. No, I said, but it's pretty good for watching birds. Is that what you're doing? She reached up to adjust the elastic band in her hair, her slight figure briefly open to view, small-waisted, small-breasted, round-hipped, and entirely self-assured as she released and recaptured the mass of black curls. I looked away and started telling her about the rail I'd been chasing. I didn't get a good look at it, I said, but it was acting like a rail, lurking around under the reeds, very secretive, never flying. It has this weird call. I cupped my hands over my mouth and tried to imitate the hollow trill, and then I got self-conscious and fell silent. Usually people glaze over and look for the first escape route when you start talking about birding. I knew this, and yet here I was, describing a bird I'd hardly even seen, trying to imitate a call that would have been impossible for even the most adept bird call impersonator, which I wasn't. But Alejandra listened attentive, attentively, and when I broke off, she looked around curiously, as if in search of my elusive rail. Thanks. Hi, I'm Tom Fleischner. I'm going to be reading uh, part of an essay called The Grace of Wildness. I uh, originally was uh, included in this uh, book, Singing Stone, A Natural History of the Escalante Canyons. Later was uh, adapted for a collection called Red Rock Testimony, which was actually to be presented to members of Congress to, uh, to advocate for a Bears Ears National Monument. And then that was adapted into this book, Red Rock Stories, edited by Stephen Trimble, uh, who we'll be hearing from here shortly. Uh, so grace of wildness. The moment we hoist packs, the rain begins. It is four days before fall equinox. This is no spring mist. A horizontal wind slaps wet against us and the cold stings our faces. Other problems soon become apparent. Crippling blisters, forgotten gear, lethargy. It's a long walk, much of it in loose sand. The group's mood is sullen as the sky. Concerned about water, I try to hurry them along, circling back with words of encouragement and offerings of dried fruit. They tolerate me, that's all. Then comes our first grace. At midday, the clouds blow off like the unfurling of a curtain. We have descended deep into the canyon of burnished Wingate sandstone. The students get their first look at the lovely juxtaposition of red rock and Utah blue sky. Yet if they notice at all, it's to report that they're getting hot. But shedding layers of clothing isn't a real option. The air remains sweatshirt cool even though the sun is out. Several days of rain provide a damp chill to the air. Fast hikers get stiff muscles waiting for stragglers while slow ones get aggravated when everyone heads out just as they finally limp up. It's now we receive the second grace of the day. I round a bend to see one of the students running back toward me. Tom, you've got to come here, quick. She signals me forward and points at the wet clay in the wash bottom. Lying there, shivering on the cold mud, is a robin-sized, slate-gray bird with muscular black feet and a broad mouth. In all my years as a naturalist, I've never had an encounter like this. A bird on the ground for the taking. Recalling handling techniques from banding birds two decades earlier, I carefully pick up the bird, nestle its back against my warm palm, and brace its head between my first two fingers. Its eyes glisten with vulnerability and attention, but it remains motionless in my hand. For the first time all day, each of us is transported into the realm of something larger and more mysterious than our own emotions. Thoughts of hurt feet, dry mouths, and martyred leadership all evaporate as we gaze silently at the creature in my palm. 
So I have studied birds for over 20 years. I am disoriented. Who is this? The visceral connection between the bird's fluttering heartbeat and the nerve tips in my fingers focuses me on this animal as an individual being, not a member of a species. This bird, woman, or man, stunned by the cold, stares back at me. For five minutes, we all watch wordlessly. Then I feel power returning to its long wings. I carefully curl back my fingers and level my hand. The gray bird sits still for a few seconds, then suddenly leaps from my hand it and flaps its long wings once, twice, three times. The instant it's in flight, I recognize it as one of my favorite canyon birds, a white-throated swift. It circles higher and higher above us. Then, from a nearby cliff, a second swift surges toward the first. They circle together, becoming smaller and smaller, and disappear against the red cliff. The individual being has disappeared completely back into the anonymity of the species. We humans look into each other's eyes, remaining silent for a few seconds before the answers come tumbling out. What was it? Why was it lying on the ground? How did you know what to do? I answer as best I can. It's a white-throated swift. I don't have any idea how it ended up on the ground, but once there, it was stuck. Swifts are among the most aerial of all birds. They can only take off by launching from the ledge. How did I know what to do? I just followed my instincts, remembering the proper way to hold a bird and watching its eyes very, very closely. We sling our heavy packs back on and resume our gradual movement down the canyon toward water. But our eyes keep scanning the cliffs for the catapulting flight of swifts. The sky trembles with a new possibility. My fingertips still carry the lingering heartbeat of fear and the joy of refound freedom. Thank you. Our assignment for this reading was Story in the Ecological Imagination. And these days, all of my stories have to do with advocacy in these perilous times. This piece started out as an op-ed and is turning into an essay. And I'll read you a fragment of a piece I'm calling In Defense of Pinion Nut Nation. As he wreaks havoc on our lives and our nation, Donald Trump seems to demonstrate a special hatred for the Southern Utah Red Rock country I call home. He's eviscerated Utah's national monuments, even though he couldn't locate Bears Ears on a map or name the five native nations who created the visionary healing proposal for Bears Ears National Monument. Grand Staircase Escalante's treasure trove of dinosaur fossils means nothing to him. The president is intent on opening up every last square inch of public land, right up to the boundaries of arches, canyonlands, and Capitol Reef National Parks to keep fossil fuel profiteers in business, to preserve the petroleocracy. He caters to the tiny in number, but politically powerful cattlemen and county commissioners by hacking away hundreds of thousands of acres of native trees and shrubs to grow grass for cows. Trump's implacable aggression toward my home landscape takes direct aim at the pinyon juniper woodland of the Southwest the third most extensive plant community in the country. I'll fess up, I love these woodlands. The trees show the gnarled character of rugged individualism. You could even say American exceptionalism in their burnished branches and stage-crafted settings. Junipers and pinion pines can live for 1,500 years. A few reach twice that age. This humble forest needing only 10 trees per acre to qualify as forest is the x-axis of the desert west, the baseline. Shrubs like creosote bush and sagebrush dominate deserts. Bunch grasses blanket the plains. Great forests roll across our mountains. But in between, from 4,500 feet to 6,500 feet, lies the woodland of junipers and pinyon pines so crucial to native people and wildlife so defining of southwestern landscapes. Pinions and junipers are the size of humans. 
We don't look down at them casually. We don't gaze up in awe. We are equal in scale. Tree usually means tall, vertical, but these trees often are round. They have the reserved warmth of a native grandmother. I've lived surrounded by these durable dryland trees off and on throughout my adult life. They are my companions and I mourn these attacks. When I headed south to live in Tucson in my 20s, as much as I loved the Sonoran Desert, I always felt like a visitor. I moved to Flagstaff, Arizona for a time, but the fragrant ponderosa pines blocked my view. Shoveling snow off my roof grew tiresome. I was a thousand feet too high. I left for Santa Fe, where I gloried in the woodland and azure high desert sky. And now for 20 years, my family has lived part-time in our home on a mesa in Southern Utah, embedded in the woodland affectionately known to Southwesterners as PJ. For me, this band of woodland defines the perfect environment and climate, skirting the mountains perched above the basins, not as scorching as full-blown deserts, not as snowy as mountain forest, just above. With plenty of water, junipers can be as rotund and fecund as the Venus of Willendorf, the Paleolithic figurine who graces the first few pages of every art history book. Robust bunches of scaly juniper needle leaves weighing down branches like the florets of broccoli or cauliflower shimmer with showers of turquoise berries. Pinions are looser limber, looser limbed true pines with familiar needles. And the source of pine nuts, the most important food for native people anywhere they grow. Southwestern cultures revere the trees and they figure prominently in ceremony. When ethnobotanist Gary Nabhan mapped the food nations of North America, he gave pinion nut nation the same weight as salmon nation or bison nation. In slick rock cracks, the trees persist century after century, adding new layers of wood in good years slowly crafting themselves into solitary sculptures. Juniper arms twist into eroded points as if pulled to their limits by Giacometti, the sculptor intent on capturing their attenuated grace. Pinions erode to stubs, their shallow ridded snags blowing over in storms, then rolling onto their crowns upside down candelabras. Each tree is distinct preserving centuries of climatic records. Killing a single tree feels destructive, chaining 10,000 acres, chewing up whole mountainsides for scientifically suspect reasons, feels like wanton slaughter. Donald J. Trump doesn't dream up these assaults, but he cheers on his destructive team as they pummel everything I value, everything I love. As Americans, our job is to fight back. As writers, our job is to write back. Thank you so much, everyone. And if all my colleagues could unmute and uh, themselves and get back on the video so we can all say hello, that'd be wonderful. So, <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and um, what a wonderful range of, of, uh, of perspectives and, uh, and views. Nalini, you're still invisible. Um, so um, before we um, uh, um, get going, I wanted to, I, I want to, uh, before we get to the list, a great list of questions that are coming in from the audience, but I want to invite uh, the group of writers here the panelists to see if they have anything they'd like to say or ask or, or reflect on. Um, I will I'll mention again, if, in case some people came late that unfortunately Drew Lanham ended up having a conflict tonight and he can't join us in person. One of the questions asked where, where can they sign up for Drew's church? And uh, um, one answer is uh, at least another sermon is it, uh, as it happens, uh, we at the Natural History Institute are having another program uh, with Drew in a couple of weeks, August 20th. And you can get 
uh, the all the information at naturalhistoryinstitute.org. So, but we're, we're delighted to have everybody else here. Um, any anybody have anything you would like to uh, say or ask or anything before we get to the audience questions? Steve, I have a question for Richard. I know that you believe wholeheartedly in natural history journaling. And I was curious how much of your descriptions came from your journaling in those alpine places, which is so critical to everything that we all do. I really appreciate that question, Stephen. Um, I think that, you know, those observations did come from journaling, you know, that the journaling and the writing uh, are kind of a conversation with each other. And the, they tend to, the, the deep attention that one pays when one is journaling informs the writing. I often use my drawings and my journal entries um, in my writing, I refer to them quite a bit. So I do, I really do appreciate that question. Thank you. Anything else, crew, Susan? Uh, you're, you're muted, Susan. Thing here. There we go. Um, first of all, I just have a comment that um, you Westerners, Richard and, and Stephen, you made me so homesick <laughs> listening <laughs> to your readings. Um, and, and the other thing, I wanted to throw out, I don't know if anyone will have a comment on this, but most of you are also still are working scientists. And I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering, Tom talked about um, natural history in particular as storytelling. And to me, as a, as a, a long lapsed chemist, um, the science I did was also storytelling it was it was a way of understanding and 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 finding the sense the plot <laughs> in nature and i'm just sort of wondering how your scientific practice and your writing practices interrelate that's a very sort of vague question if anybody has any comments anybody I can jump in a little bit you know that the project that I'm working on, this this conversation of essays and poems, uh, I'm writing the essays. My my uh, my collaborator Stephen Nightingale is writing the poems. But each of the essays is, I, I you know I, I think of that as more as kind of in the role of my teaching. You know, it's it's a way of of encapsulating a lot of the teaching that I do in the field and in the classroom. And there's little science lessons that are buried within within each essay. And I didn't really get to that with this particular reading that I shared with today, but each of those, at least in the essays I'm featuring are there's science that's really deeply a part of that. And the storytelling provides a, a vehicle to kind of share the magic of that science. Um, and, and I actually wanted to turn that question a little bit to Silita. I'm really interested in, you know, how she, you know, chose the various investigators that she worked with and um, that was a really riveting story that, that she told. And I, I wonder how the science um, informs your choices and also how, how are you using those stories to share the science as well? Because we didn't get quite to get to like what's lost in, you know, in, in the parts of cities that, that we don't get to um, engage with. And there might be a lot of reasons we don't get to engage with those, those cities. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, thanks for that question, Richard. So for me, the the story is a jumping point into the science. I, whenever I'm doing communication courses or um, you know, teaching about science communication for scientists or, or non-scientists, I frame it always as like, if I'm writing a paper, if I'm giving a talk to a group of naturalists, if I'm you know running a toddler workshop, I, I used to work at a large science museum, there's always some element of storytelling involved of how you string those things together. And so in this children's book, which is a, it's a nonfiction book, it's all about science in cities and how the people behind that science doing that science and how that science is done. But as an engaging point for a younger audience, it's you know a book for kids eight to 12, that story is really what is meant to pull them um, into the questions that you know we as scientists are excited about and help them get excited and so about this like interplay between story and science each chapter begins with a story to kind of help set the tone and engage the reader and then it continues into some more of the kind of harder questions of like you know why was Deja, Deja looking for these birds in the first place you know how does 
bias emerge and how can bias affect the questions that we ask the scientists, but also how can other people's bias affect, you know, the experience of, of racialized scientists uh, working in the field. And so I, I don't know if that quite answers the question, but for me, like the storytelling was key to getting kids excited about the science that's occurring. Um, I'll jump in, Tom. Actually, Steve Trimble and I did a little workshop on the science and storytelling here in Salt Lake City for the Nature Conservancy. And one thing that came up that I, I, I'm still kind of going back and forth in my own mind is, 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 is the interplay between storytelling and science. And if we rely only on storytelling, I think we run into danger um, because I think science is about telling stories, but I think, I think of my science and ecologist science as allowing the data to provide the, the story that we end up hearing and believing. And I think there can almost sometimes be a danger in relying only on storytelling because if Donald Trump tells a story about bear's ears and people take that as the truth that should emerge and then they look at Steve's interpretation and his story about bear's ears, we get two different things. But if we use scientific data the way ecologists do, I think there's some, I, I would hope, I, I have some faith that there's, there's sort of a, a truth that emerges from that. However, I think storytelling is really needed to convey, to engage, uh, to link and connect with people who may not relate directly to the, the stories that data tell. So I think what we're doing, what we've done today, and what storytellers, scientific storytellers do is super important, but I, I wouldn't want to say that those two are the same. And, I wanted to go back to Salita for just a sec. She said, uh, when her character got to the pun, she said, I'm a scientist. And I thought that just that simple phrase has a lot to do with everything in your book, I suspect. You know, it's a statement of identity. And um, if you make that statement first, then you can go on and tell stories with credibility. But I love the, the, just the simplicity of that statement of identity. It, get, it got complicated by race, obviously, but I'm a scientist seemed like it had a lot to do with everything that happened today. Julia, I think you were about to say something. Yeah. Um, science is definitely um, a big presence in all the books that I write, but it, it seems to take a different form depending on the book. Um, so in this one, when I'm trying to engage um, or I'm asking the audience to reimagine where nature is and how they see it and how they perceive it, um, I bring science, but it's always in the background. So I tell them, okay, here are all the ways that noise, um, even in a restaurant um, or traffic noise, et cetera, et cetera, here's the science, although I don't call it that, of how it can make you sick. Um, over time, there are significant health impacts with them. Um, or I tell them the various studies about um, the amount of time people are outside every day, uh, what it does to their physical, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this was tweaked by something else that someone, one of the other panelists said. Um, in my forthcoming book, I'm actually kind of turning the story process over to the students um, and having them write stories and imagine, um, well, the first assignment is telling the old story of climate change and then imagining new stories and giving them prompts, et cetera, et cetera. So they've been reading about the science of communicating climate change, but then they're relying on their own stories and their own imaginings. And so that's why I was excited for this panel story and the ecological imagination of having them go forward and imagining their own stories. That's great. I might just add one thing to this topic. Um, many years ago, I in an in a, an article I published in the in the academic journal Conservation Biology, I made the statement that feelings and facts are both important. And and certainly it's the science that provides us with the facts so that things are ground truthed. We, we come at the truth that way, but stories are what tend to generate the feelings. Um, like most, um, this just a just an observation that most uh, peer reviewed scientific papers don't engender a whole lot of deep feeling in most of us, uh, even though they can be incredibly important and are incredibly important. And so a lot of the 
the, the stories and the way several people here have, have taken their own research and translated them, you might say, so that, so that both the facts are present and the feelings are felt. And that seems to be really important. Susan. Um, I just want to, I just want to sort of touch back to what Nalini was saying about the dangers of, I mean, we walk this fine, so, so I write fiction. So, so this danger of, um, on the one hand, on the one hand, I have free reign because, because the premise is that it's fiction and hopefully the reader doesn't expect to learn facts, but to get engaged. <laughs> um, so I can explore feeling a lot, but where, where my original question kind of came from was also, I was thinking about um, the way as scientists in the actual production of knowledge, there is an element of story in what we do. We, 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 we come from the observation and from the data, but in trying to make sense of it, we can't, as human beings, we can't work without some of those elements of narrative, maybe without the feeling. And so I'm thinking, so I wrote like my last book um, bef before uh, Accidentals was a, um, a science book, a work of nonfiction. And I was adamant, it's called Echoes of Life. Um, and it's, it's, it's about organic geochemistry. Uh, and I was, I, was, I was adamant that I was not going to write a popular science book because I didn't want to water down the science. So it's, it's a book for a broad disciplinary range of scientists, but I used narrative, I used story to, so that chemists, for example, could engage with the geologists do and the geologists could engage with the chemists do, which they do usually like to do. So I used the history of the development of the science to bring across the actual science. So, so the feelings that Tom was talk, talking about are maybe sidelined in that book, but they're still narrative. And it's the narrative that 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 scientists use every day in in their work, and and we're always being very careful with it because exactly as Nalini says, you, I mean that's why scientific papers have all the elements of narrative removed from them, <laughs> um, and yet we use it to make sense of what we're seeing. It's great. And as a fiction writer, you have to get the science right, and you have to if you if you get the details wrong. If you're writing a story, if you're writing fiction, uh, if you're writing about landscape and you get the, the wrong plant in the wrong place or screw up your, the references to native people, anything like that, as soon as you lose the reader's trust, you've lost the reader. And so you have this huge responsibility, even as a writer of fiction, to be super careful with fact. Yeah, not everybody takes that responsibility seriously. Um, which is kind of what this program I run in Germany is all about fiction meets science. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's the same as it's, if you set a story in San Francisco and you put the bridge on the wrong side of the city or something, you know, people, people are going to lose trust in the story. It's kind of the mm -hmm. same kind of thing. Yeah, I had a question. I, I think I'd like to begin by just directing it to Nalini. I think, you know, this idea of, of data and of storytelling and, each of these, these different modes do different kinds of persuasion. And so much of your work that you've talked about, which is really moving, was a very different kind of persuasion, a way of connecting the, really the, the, the objects, the, the, the beings that you love, and helping people in these, in these communities of faith really connect to them. And the kind of persuasion that you're using there is really different. Um, all of us are using different kinds of persuasion there, but I'd love to hear more about your choices around that and what you're doing, what you do differently when you think about, about that kind of persuasion or approaching your audiences and how you, you tell stories in different ways to, to different audiences and the kind of work that you're doing. Yeah, that's a great question. And I've been, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I have sort of my scientist self that loves to do the more objective work and collect data and, and use statistics to, to come up with my understanding of how canopy plants exist in tropical rainforests and what happens when you disturb them. And then there's another piece of the work that is about raising awareness and raising a sense of connection with other people who might not be convinced by the scientific story alone. And I think what I've evolved through over the years with working with faith-based groups, with incarcerated men and women, uh, with urban youth, is to practice what I've sort of come to call 
um, intellectual humility, the idea that perhaps science is not the only single best way of knowing. It's one that I think is the best way of knowing. It's the one that I have spent 40 years training myself, steeping myself in. I think all of us at the ESA have sort of bought into science as, as a really great way of knowing. But I don't think that means that it's the only way of knowing that has validity. And I think if we as scientists can step away just for a moment uh, and consider that there might be other valuable ways of knowing and understanding other values of trees, for example, that a logger who has spent his or her life cutting down trees to make timber that we use for our homes, or somebody who's very religious, who understands, you know, there are 328 references to trees in the Old Testament and really understands the tree of life and how that is a symbol of God's givingness to what, what has happened in the world, making all the plants and animals. Um, that's really kind of the same worship or the same sense of um, the importance of living things as what I think of as this, as, as um, all of us, I think, have been saying is, you know, the, the product of evolution. And so I think that we don't have to become Baptists when we speak or try to connect with Baptists. I don't have to become a logger and chop down trees for a living to, to get how a tree stands and lives. But I can, if I put aside my scientific prejudice, I guess I would say, just for the moment in order to make that connection, in order to allow that exchange be two way, that what does a logger know about tree physiology, tree structure, wood anatomy that I might gain from, um, just as he might open his mind to my understanding of tree ecology and forest and, and, and tree anatomy, then we have some grounds, common grounds that we can both learn from and both appreciate and then walk away from each other if needed. So I think that's really the philosophy that I've had that where I see science as this body of knowledge and understanding in one place that I cherish and I love and I've devoted, devoted my career to, but there are bridges to these other ways of knowing that I think can be valuable to us as ecologists um, but we, we do have to make this effort to get off the podium, to get out of the classroom, to walk away from our field sites, to get out of the science library to, in order to be in the venues and be with the groups of people that, that have these different ways of knowing and different values. And it's really hard to do that when you've spent your whole professional life thinking you're right all the time. Uh, but, I, but I think it's a really great thing. To, but it doesn't mean we have to abandon science or to turn our backs on it. I think that's the really critical thing. I'm as proud of my publications in ecology as, as anybody could be. But I'm also proud of the sermons that I've given in these churches because I think that's been a window for me to, to be a little bit more intellectually humble and to come away with a sense of congregants as partners, congregants as, as fellow understanders of the natural world. So words to live by. Um, I want to. I want to. Uh, in the interest of time, I want to 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 try to inc tie in here some of the questions that have been coming from from folks uh, watching. And um, there, there's a few that are for specific people that we'll get to. But uh, I thought I'd start. And I have been noticing as we've been talking, we've been actually sort of addressing some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, but there are a couple things trying to tie together a couple of these that, that I'll put out that I think ties into some of what we've just been talking about. But there was one question about um, a, a, a reflection that what we're doing here tonight is somewhat on the margins of both uh, written and oral platforms of communication. And do we have any thoughts about the strengths and weaknesses of either of those or how we synthesize them? And another, um, somewhat parallel question was asking uh, us to um, reflect on the um, uh, relationship between science, storytelling, and myth. And myth is one thing that hasn't come up yet. So before we move on to some of the other more specific questions, anybody have any comments on any of that? Any of those relationships? Susan. Um, I'll just lead off with a, maybe this will get everybody, other people going on the, um, uh, more of a, a listener, a readers and listeners reaction to the question about um, oral versus written traditions and, and how tonight we sort of were, were walking the line between both. And um, my response as a, as a listener tonight was actually, cause I don't, okay, I'm gonna out myself. I don't actually read a lot of um, nonfiction natural history. Um, 
but I love listening to it. It's almost like listening to poetry. So, so listening to you guys tonight and also, and, and, and listening to Drew's polemic sort of um, was, was a completely different experience than if I read them. On, I, I mean, I, I might not have picked them up to read on the page, you know, it was just a really uh, different experience for me. Whereas something, this sort of long convoluted novel that I wrote, you know, is something that I, I would personally pick up and that, that I don't think of as much as, as an oral tradition as the, these, um, uh, this, this, I mean, it's like poetry, what you guys were, were, were doing for me and in the way that I can listen to poetry uh, in a, it, that's different than the way I, I might see it on the page. That's just a personal reaction. Okay. Maybe I could, I could just jump in I'm, around the connection between storytelling myth and science um, is, is something that I heard in a lot of the pieces was an almost uh, mythic, I'm thinking specifically Stephen's piece, sort of a mythic embrace of these trees, these beings um, of, as of having a, a power. He has this deep affection for them. I almost have a mythic power of attraction. I certainly feel about that up the mountain range I've been writing about um, and that you know, the science itself is not enough to really express the totality of what one experiences there. Um, and that it seems that these kinds of places, these kinds of trees, these mountains, these, um, you know, these, even these individuals who are going out and, you know, kind of risking their safety to do work that there's a kind of mythic quality to that. I mean, Salita is writing about a hero there. So I, I think that's, um, I, and I imagine that this, these kids are going to read this, this book of hers and, you know, see, I, I can connect with that person. And they, they have a, a kind of, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a hero myth that she's telling this person who goes out and goes through adversity, but still gets the data, you know, gets the story. I think, you know, all of these, the kind of investigative work, the kind of um, reaching for truth, um, the, the deep love and affection that we feel for these places, for these beings, um, I think there's a real mythic quality that I, I love the question because I haven't thought about in those terms that it makes me to kind of dig a little bit more deeply. And I'd love to hear what other people think about that too. Uh, Julia. I think um, I, I think of a difference kind of, um, between myth um, and mythic. And I think sometimes our cultural stories get so powerful that they become kind of the old mythical story um, and sometimes not in a good way and I think one of the power of story and, and writing in general and I agree about the uh, loving to listen to people um, tell stories as well but I think stories can investigate um, those myths in a different way and make us think about uh, why we believe and if we don't believe why not and question some of the myths that we have, whether it's consumer culture or the need for wilderness or whatever. And I think stories are um, very important for questioning um, or pointing out what we consider mythic and what is myth. Selita. I could just add uh, to what Julie is saying. I think a lot of uh, what I'm trying to do for kids and parents uh, with our book is highlight that it, you know, very much like Julia highlighted in reading her, her prologue um, from, from her book is, is this idea that, you know, you don't have to venture far and wide to experience nature. And so helping people to reimagine um, and, and re-envision how they can interact and experience things and helping them to understand that they don't go, don't have to go as far. And I think that's one of the biggest things that that we were most excited to do with this book was to help people better engage with what is like right outside their front door to help them have a bit more ownership over it and care about it a little bit more. Great, uh, Steve. Steve. Basically everything we write these days has a really strong likelihood of being listened to by our readers. You know, everyone I know is reading reading books by listening to them on Audible. And now even online, at the top of almost every piece, you can listen to the piece rather than listen to it. So all the more reasons for us to never publish anything without reading it aloud first, which is something I tell my writing students to do. And if they can read it as well as Silita read her piece, we'll all be in really good shape. 
<laughs> so um, again, in the interest of time, I'm trying to keep my eye on the clock here. Um, so I want to not um, mm -hmm. uh, miss out on getting answers to a couple questions. And Sailita, since we were just talking about your great piece, um, there was uh, uh, a couple of questions for you. One was, um, if you could reiterate the age group that the book is intended for, and then a follow-up question, which got lots of thumbs up was, and how can we pre-order a copy? <laughs> so the book is intended for uh, children ages eight to 12. Uh, unfortunately, you can't pre-order it just yet. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not uh, set to be published till fall of 2021, which is an entire year from now. And it's, I, I can't, it cannot come fast enough. Uh, so if you wanna stay up to date on uh, publication, and pre-order, you're best to follow me uh, on Twitter. Uh, it's at Sylita Guy. And I also have a website, so I will post updates there as well. Great. Um, and um, Steve, there was a uh, kind of a, a comment, a comment slash question that came in um, uh, from Anya. Hello, Anya. Um, She's, she said, your words were especially poignant today after watching Trump mispronounce Yosemite. Apparently he said Yosemite in a national briefing. And so much of our leadership in the US has no idea what is at stake. How can, so here's in the question part, uh, which would be for all of us really, how can we use natural history, storytelling, art and science communication to protect public lands and save the world? And are there any examples of times it has made the difference? Well, the, the answer I have to start with is the book that you contributed to, Tom. Um, I've been editor and co-editor of a couple of books of essays that we took directly to Congress to put the words of writers like all of you into the, into the hearts and souls of the decision makers. <clears throat> One book called Testimony that I co-edited with Terry Tempest Williams uh, 20 year, more than 20 years ago in a book that we recently did as Bears Ears approached um, this, the moment of decision for the Obama administration that, as Tom said, started out as Red Rock testimony given to the decision makers and then became a trade book, yes. uh, the chap book there, and then the trade book, Red Rock Stories. And we know that testimony actually did make a difference. President Clinton told Terry Tempest Williams when he stood at the rim of the Grand Canyon and declared Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument that the book made a difference. That, those were his words. These days, barring putting together a book of essays about a place that's in danger, write letters to the editor, write op-eds. They're incredibly powerful. And we writers and all you scientists have the credibility and the skills to write things that will get published and get read by hundreds of thousands of people, including decision makers. And that's our power. Thank you. Anybody else in the group wanna respond to that? Um, let's see. Um, I, can, uh, I, I was gonna say something, Tom. Yeah, but, sure. Uh, I've been thinking about you know, the power of natural historians, the power of ecologists, whom we write for, where we put our writing and who writes it. And as we become more desperate in these, you know, these difficult times where the environment and where ecology is just falling away, I've been thinking more and more about you know, a Netflix series called La Selva, you know, which is about a field station where there are all kinds of steamy romances between the scientists and um, the stories, really, the human stories that, that we watch on Netflix. But to have packed in there facts and figures about how many species of ants, where epiphytes get their nutrients, um, where these characters become spokespeople for what we are, I think, collect, what we collectively value. But I think we have to kind of partner with other communicators as well as write our essays and write our books, you know, with natural history presses and so forth, because the situation is just so dire now that it's not just Trump who can't pronounce Yosemite, it's his voters, many of his voters. And so where do they get their information? What do they get attached to? I think we need to think more about, more and more about um, other vehicles and other modes where our knowledge of natural history could be channeled in order to excite, inform, and move people to, to action. So if there are any screenwriters out there who are listening to this or you know any, 
I just feel like that's kind of a way to go. I might add that here at the Natural History Institute, as in the pandemic times, and we've had to shut down a whole lot of our, our normal field yeah. programming and so on, we've just kicked off a new series called Notes from the Field, which is all short videos about, you know, various things. You know, first one, the series on biology of galls and a bunch of different stuff. But yeah, I think that the, the um, writing is wonderful, but storytelling writ large is, yeah. is what moves us. It doesn't have to just be in, in the written form. So uh, we have a number of, of great questions. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, cognizant that the time is getting um, long. Um, a couple of people, um, I think a uh, couple of questions um, that, um, that, that tie into things. One um, person mentioned something that I was thinking about in terms of the question about myth, which one of the funny things, of course, about that word in our culture is that it, it has two different meanings, which are virtually uh, opposites. One is like the deepest truth, and the other is is something that is that is an illusion or is is wrong, you know. And um, and so, uh, uh, anonymous attendee said that curiously, when scientists use the word myth uh, in a paper, they tend to mean that it's a mis something is a misconception. That's kind of how it's often treated in the scientific literature. And then. Um, uh, Where'd you go here? Uh, Alana, hello, Alana, um, um, said that she really appreciated Nalini's comment about intellectual humility and other ways of knowing. And in her experience doing PhD fieldwork in Brazil, she learned the most uh, natural history and use, useful information from locals, farmers, hunters who have grown up in the forest where she worked. So a question for Nalini and anyone else who conducts fieldwork, how, how, do sci how can scientists incorporate and properly credit the stories and cultural knowledge that help our science move forward. So maybe we could start with you, Nalini. Um, well, I think attribution is, is really important. Uh, I think that's something that maybe scientists have not been, have not done a good job with in the past. We all know the story of stories of exploitation of drugs that have been extracted from tropical plants. It's what I'm familiar with mostly, you know, and, and now there are, you know, we're better at understanding that in fact, countries that have supported these plants in their own forests and, and habitats deserve the benefits that accrue from that sort of thing. So attribution in whatever form it is, whether it's co-authorship on a paper, whether it's recognition in the database, whether it's dollars and cents in terms of the economic benefits being shared, I think, um, or whether it's asking that group in what ways could we best provide attribution. Um, again, that's sort of this intellectual humility, just putting somebody's name in the, you know, in the acknowledgements may mean absolutely nothing for the local person, but standing up at a city hall meeting or a town hall meeting and saying, I thank the people in this, in this town that, that allowed me to carry out this research may be very meaningful. So I think it's always about listening. It's always about taking in and being as sensitive as we can to the values of the people with whom we work. Anybody else want to address that? Well, um, we're we're uh, um, we're running short of time here. We've been going for over an hour and a half, so I want to try to pull things together. There's a there's a couple um, of things here that might be a good place to sort of wrap up. Um, uh, when we have a uh, comment about um, s several things about filmmaking and so on, and we actually have Jessica here um, said, "I'm a screenwriter, filmmaker, mythologist interested in listening, and very curious to know what stories." Um, uh, we all think are the most important to be shared at this time. So that might be um, an interesting place to end. Are there other stories that we feel um, particularly essential to be told right now? Julia. My own bias, but I think it's a big important one and that is that climate change is not distant and uh, affecting polar bears. I love Drew's comment about that. Um, but it's right here right now and it's affecting people in their everyday lives. And to me, climate change is not a matter of science at this point. It's a matter of culture and it's a matter of um, accepting and helping people understand how it's affecting their lives right now. Um, so in very concrete, regional, local ways to make those connections uh, very apparent. And I like the, the comments about the uh, 
uh, Netflix or whatever. So I had a seminar, a grad seminar in climate communication who chose as their final project, um, a pilot episode of something that we called Lignite. And it was so well done. It was amazing. It was uh, about a, a California family moving into a coal town called Lignite in Utah. Uh, they made that up and um, bringing in solar manufacturing plant to try and train coal uh, miners to this plant. And there's lots of conflict and there's lots of, you know, everyday stuff that goes on to it. So I wish Hollywood, I wish Netflix, et cetera, would do a whole lot more of that. Anybody else? Steve. Uh, I agree completely with Julia. And I think that one of the most important ways to tell the climate change story is to connect with native people. You know, some of the most powerful stories are what's happening to Arctic people. And I wanted to put in a plug for places to read important stories that not everyone may know about. Uh, High Country News is sort of the paper of record of the American West. And they're really broadening their coverage into including a lot of people of color and native people. They're doing a fabulous job. And Orion Magazine, if you don't know Orion, you should subscribe. Wonderful place for stories about people in nature. Hey. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out a little a little bit on this one. Um, and Tom, I think this relates a lot to some of the ideas that you talk about around love, natural history, and the practice of love. Um, and I think I you know I heard actually communicated in a lot of what people shared today from their readings. And I, you know, I, I'm thinking about not so much the audience who doesn't understand that climate change is is a clear and urgent and pressing issue, but like ecologists, people who are attending this conference. Um, and I think the, uh, this idea of hope versus love, and I think there's a, there's a difference. And I've been thinking a lot about the importance of recognizing that, that hope is an idea, ho we, hope is an embrace of the world that we want, that we want to live in. Love is an embrace of the world that, it, that, it, that is. And I think, I don't know if this is a story so much, but more of an idea that the importance of continuing to be motivated by our work to to speak for the earth in terms of what we find as scientists, to speak for the earth in terms of, you know, the kind of writing that, that Stephen was doing. It's, it's really deeply informed by, by a, a strong connection, by a love for these trees. And I think that, that story, that love story that we have with the natural world, that's an important one to be telling over and over again. The kind of love story that, that Silita is trying to cultivate with, you know, the, her potential readers, um, you know, nature exists all around us. It doesn't, it's not just up in, you know, what we, places we think of as wild, but it's in our backyards, it's in our, in our playgrounds. I think the, the access to the natural world, um, the potential for falling in love with the natural world is a, is a story that we need to keep reminding people about um, because that ultimately motivates the kind of action and the sense of urgency um, is that connection. As I wanna to add to that. And then Susan, um, uh, just cause you, you, you said part of what I was thinking about there, Richard, is that I, I think the story, in my mind, the first thing that came to mind is that the stories that are needed are stories that can make us authentically hopeful. Uh, because so many stories that we hear about the relationship of people and, and the rest of creation are demoralizing um, and, and devastating in so many ways. And that can be immobilizing. That, that, can, that can actually almost be counterproductive if, it's, if that's too much of what we hear. Uh, you know, I was a college professor for many years. I taught conservation biology every year, and I I found that especially in the final, in the later years of doing that, the single hunger that I felt the most from students was, give me an authentic handhold to have hope about the future, and don't bullshit me. You know, because I'm going to recognize that. And so it's a it's a, that's a, I think one of the that's the tension that's at the that's at at the center of, of our whole relationship with the world right now is how do we how do we bear witness to the degradation and and at the same time find legitimate sources of hope and of course as, as Richard uh, suggests my personal uh, soapbox has been that that the practice of natural history attentiveness to nature is what can keep refeeding that sense of hope um, and love so um, Susan, you had your hand up a moment oh, ago. Oh, I, I, I was this. I was just going to add. I mean, 
this this struggle that 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 you're talking about and that Richard was talking about this this love almost and then hope as to uh, that's the story of accidentals i mean that's the struggle that the young man in accidentals is is um dealing with and i and you know it it is kind of hopeful at the end in a weird sort of way much more hopeful than i actually feel but Mm -hmm. that i felt that that I had the character in the novel is 23 years old. I had to give him something. Um, so it comes exactly from this, uh, this, this struggle that we have, um, I think with, with our love for the natural world and, and f- trying to find some hope to, uh, to, to that it will continue to exist. Well, there's still been some great questions and so on, but I think I'm going to uh, have to, to sort of wrap us up here for, uh, for among other reasons, we've been all engaged here for a long time. And also there is another event for those who are part of the ESA conference. There is another event coming up in uh, about 15 or 20 minutes, which is a, a film um, and discussion regarding the film. And we want to honor that and not overlap with that. Uh, and we encourage people who are involved with the conference to participate in that. So I just want to thank all of my colleagues here. It's been a wonderful uh, conversation. Thank you so much for your wonderful words and for making the time to be here uh, this evening. And um, uh, and they and thank you to all of the people participating from all over um, uh, the world, actually, for being part of this as well. Uh, reiterate that that. Uh, very shortly, probably tomorrow, the the uh, there'll be a video of this uh, whole event on the uh, Natural History Institute YouTube page, um, and uh, so feel free, please share it widely. Um, and um, as on behalf of the Natural History Institute, that hat, um, I would uh, invite you all to to. Uh, feel yourselves part of our community because this is the sort of work we're trying to do uh, integrating art science and humanities so um, and there'll be uh, the website and so on and also again uh, thanks again to the King's English Bookstore who uh, was going to host this in person but has been a great partner here and their website with links to uh, books from from most of the people who have been on the panel tonight will be up at the end here as well Um, so Thank you so much and uh, good night or good morning to those of you in (laughs) Germany or wherever. So thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tom. (laughs) Yeah.